there was recently a paper on Turing, which uh, yeah. I think you were you were a co-author on. Uh, it's right. like Turing, Turing decline relation to aging. Um, and that produced a result, I think, in, at least in terms of, for mice, mice anyway, mm -hmm. um, which was comparable to what we were seeing in rapamycin when we first tried it. Right. Uh, I just kind of your comments on, do you think taurine could be like another rapamycin or do you have any idea about the mechanism? Because I guess we don't really understand why taurine is helping in the way that rapamycin does. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so taurine is, is really interesting. So taurine is very different from rapamycin in the sense that it's a natural metabolite. Um, uh, so it's not a pharmaceutical, it's not regulated by FDA. You can buy taurine, you know, as a supplement now. So it's different in that sense. Um, I think what that paper, that paper was a very interesting paper. I should say I, I had an extremely small role in that, that paper. My lab did a couple of experiments, but we were really not the, the leaders on that. Um, uh, but I think it was interesting because that paper did a nice job, which a lot of papers don't, of making the case that taurine levels decline with age, at least in laboratory animals across many different species. And in fact, also in, in non-human primates and even some evidence in humans that this is the case. So you have a natural metabolite that shows a decline with age. And then when you supplement it back, you can actually increase lifespan, you know, at least again, in the laboratory models in, mm -hmm. in worms and, and flies and mice. And like you said, the lifespan effect in mice was kind of comparable to the first studies on, on rapamycin. Now, I think it's an open question because the experiments haven't been done yet. You know, if you were to do a real dose response, for example, with taurine, could you do better? That's an open mm -hmm. question. Maybe you could get up to the point, you know, where the kind of the best effect people have gotten with rapamycin at this point. Um, I think it's important to say one thing that that needs to be done is a test of taurine across other genetic backgrounds of mice. So one of the things that we know about rapamycin is it seems to work across multiple genetic backgrounds. So that's an important follow on set of studies uh, with taurine. Um, but it's it's it, I, I would say you know the, the, that paper alone kind of puts taurine in the second tier I would say of of interventions of interest right now in in the field. Now what the mechanism is. That's it's, it's hard to be too specific because taurine, because of where it sits and, and the type of metabolite it is, and, and it's involved in um, sulfur uh, sulfur metabolism, um, it ties in to a bunch of different pathways that have been linked to longevity and aging, you know, throughout throughout the literature for many years. So, for example, um, uh, sulfur amino acid biosynthesis, methionine restriction, things like that, potential relationship there. Um, and then uh, redox status and glutathione biology. So taurine is pretty closely connected to uh, glutathione, which is a you know super important antioxidant in the body. For a long time, people have been um, interested in the role of oxidative stress and redox biology and aging. There's tons and tons of data connecting reactive oxygen species and and uh, uh, redox stress to longevity. So I think that's a plausible place where taurine could be acting, but it's going it, to, it, it's going to, I think, take a while to really figure that out. And again, I will say in some ways it feels kind of like tor. I, I alluded previously to the fact that tor is sort of this super important protein that does everything. That's a little mm -hmm. bit of an oversimplification, but, but it's centrally involved in a whole bunch of cellular processes that may explain why TOR can have such a big effect on the biology of aging, but that also means it becomes very hard to point to one downstream mm. effector and say, that's what rapamycin is doing. That may turn out to be the same with taurine because it's in it's connected so tightly to so many different um, aspects of cell biology. It may be kind of hard to get to a specific mechanism and it may turn out to be more than one thing. So there, I think there's a lot of work remaining to be done there. Um, you know, should people start taking taurine? I, I I don't know. I don't for what that's worth. I, I, I it hasn't gotten to the point in my, you know, estimation where I'm going to run out and start taking taurine. But um, but I'm cautiously optimistic that, you know, over the next couple of years, we'll get uh, uh, more data and better understand, you know, how it's working and what the likelihood is that um, that this is going to extrapolate to outside of the laboratory and into the real world and, and potentially in people. I'd like to see a study in dogs, I'll say as well. I think dogs are a, an interesting place mm -hmm. where uh, this could be tested in a, in a pretty reasonable time frame for effects on lifespan and, and various health span metrics. Is taurine a, a require an essential amino acid for dogs like it is for cats? 
No, so cats and dogs are a little bit different. And, and so there's some literature in, in cats that um, taurine deficiency uh, has been associated with certain types of heart disease. I don't remember the exact literature, mm -hmm. but, but there is some literature there. That does not, at least as far as I know, there's no data mm -hmm. uh, supporting that in in dogs. And and this story in cats, again, this is sort of secondhand. So this is what I've been told yeah. by some, some veterinarians. So I may not get this exactly right, but the story has something to do with, with the certain types of uh, cat food, uh, mm -hmm. cat food diets that some owners started feeding their cats ended up not having enough taurine in it. So the cats became deficient in taurine. And then it started to uncover these, these heart uh, defects. I don't think there's any evidence that that's the case in, in dogs. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it has to do with the dog's ability to, to get taurine from other sources or the composition of the diet. So, so I think so far that seems to be relatively unique to cats and it really, it has to do with the composition of the diet um, and the amount of taurine that they were getting in, in the diet just became too low. I, I haven't done a deep dive on this, so I don't know if that's something that could happen in people. If you did like a really crazy no taurine diet, I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know because I haven't done it.